Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz on the show tonight. Inglewood is Inglewood. We do our own thing. We're very self-sufficient. After a tumultuous week, neighbors tell us what they think is good in Inglewood. What we need right now is immediate, urgent ethics reform. A new ethics package comes forward even as another state lawmaker is charged with fraud. There's too much uncertainty. The potential financial fallout from a canceled fall football season. The Archdiocese of Chicago says classes will be held in person this fall. So what are school officials doing to prevent an outbreak? We want to help. We want to help. Meanwhile, Chicago Public School students march to remove officers from school hallways. What local school councils are doing to address the controversy. Why the wage gap between black women and white men hasn't improved in 25 years. And watch out, it's Shark Week. There's a local citizen scientist already hundreds of hours deep into it. We have her story. But first, a surge in mail-in voting applications. Paris starts us off with more on that and other top stories from today. Paris. That's right, Brandis. More Chicagoans than ever before have applied to vote by mail amid health concerns over in-person voting triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Chicago Board of Elections reports it has already received more than 230,000 applications for mail-in ballots. That shattered the previous record of 118,000 requests for this year's primary election. This comes as President Donald Trump says in a phone interview on Fox Business News this morning that he blocked extra funding for mail-in voting and the U.S. Postal Service because he believes Democrats are seeking to have universal vote by mail. Trump says without evidence that he believes that will lead to widespread voter fraud. Now, they need that money in order to have the post office work so it can take all of these millions and millions of ballots. Now, in the meantime, they aren't getting there. By the way, those are just two items. But if they don't get those two items, that means you can't have universal mail-in voting because they're not equipped to have it. And you can find more out about the surge in requests for mail-in ballots as well as how to get one on our website, wttw.com slash news. A new plan calls for sweeping changes to agreements with police unions in order to allow officers to be held accountable for misconduct. The plan comes from Mayor Lori Lightfoot along with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. It resists calls for police departments to be defunded, but acknowledges that sending officers as the first and only response to a wide range of situations has, quote, deepened the divide between communities of color and police departments. Another attempt by community groups to stop the relocation of a controversial scrap metal plant from Lincoln Park to the far south side. Three environmental and community groups have filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. They say the city was discriminating against residents of color and violating the Fair Housing Act by negotiating an agreement with General Iron to move its metal shredding facility from Lincoln Park to the southeast side. Peggy Salazar, director of the Southeast Environmental Task Force, says in a statement, quote, I have lived in Chicago's southeast side all of my life, and I've witnessed how the city has sacrificed communities of color by making our neighborhoods the dumping grounds for the most dangerous industries, while white areas of the city flourish. Illinois passes another grim pandemic milestone with more than 200,000 cases of COVID-19 now reported in the state. In the past 24 hours, a further 1,800 cases were confirmed and 24 more deaths. The Illinois Department of Public Health has now recorded almost 7,700 deaths across 102 counties. The community of Englewood has been under the spotlight this week after a police-involved shooting touched off widespread looting, property damage, and theft Sunday night into Monday morning. A couple of nights ago, protesters clashed with police and other neighbors. As part of Chicago Tonight's In Your Neighborhood series, Brandis Friedman spent the day talking with community leaders about the work they do to prevent weeks like this one. And Brandis is back here with more. Brandis, what's the mood in Englewood right now? You know, Paris, to be honest, it was pretty quiet where we were. Um, and we started the day at a nonprofit coffee shop and, and community space, uh, Kusanya Gr Cafe at 69th and Green. It's where we met artist and project designer Eric Hotchkiss popping into his neighborhood coffee shop. He told us about a community art project that had happened just Saturday, where several groups, including Rage, that's of course the Resident Association of Greater Inglewood, the Inglewood Arts Collective, and his own business, Made in Inglewood, they took over a corner lot that had a history of violence. They added art, murals, and activities for kids. 
I guess when we say take over a space, because there are a lot of spaces, many spaces in Inglewood that aren't occupied at all, right? They're abandoned. Um, when we say take over, we say that we are doing it ourselves. When we say take over, we mean we are doing it and not the city. So this is work of the residents. Yes, it has a history and that history is well documented. And that's why it's important for me, me being a re not only a resident of Inglewood, but growing up in Inglewood and knowing that history and seeing beautification of that space. Eric Hotchkiss told us that he personally doesn't like to talk too much about the violence that this particular corner is known for, a neighborhood hotspot, which is why he said it was important for him to be part of making the space better. But you also heard him say that Inglewood residents are a community of do-it-yourselfers. We heard that same refrain from the group Growing Home, an urban nonprofit farm that provides more than 30,000 pounds of food by sale and donation to the community in this food desert. It also provides job training for people who've struggled to find work because of previous criminal charges. Interim Executive Director Janelle St. John says the community does need more support in the way of jobs and access to home ownership, but her neighbors here are still ready to do a lot on their own. A lot of Inglewood residents are making changes for themselves. So everyone thinks we're all sitting here waiting for someone to come solve our problem. We're here trying to solve our problems, but we do need resources. Equity is an issue, you know, and so we need our community from the outside to come in. But understand that we're prepared to implement those changes ourselves. Now, the Inglewood unemployment rate pre-pandemic was nearly 27 percent compared to the city's nearly 9 percent. Now, that's before everyone's unemployment numbers skyrocketed because of COVID. Janelle St. John believes the pandemic made an already difficult job market for some people even worse, especially for the young people that we've seen clashing with police and some destroying property. The youth organization that used to be around or would have been around to help engage these youth aren't there. You know, you've heard of idle hands is a devil playground. I mean, it is true. If we don't engage our youth, they're going to find alternative ways to engage themselves. And there's a lot of negative force out there waiting to embrace them. Now, separately this week, of course, there's been some back and forth between elected officials about why this happened and whether the criminal justice system has been tough enough on alleged looters. Late this afternoon, we did hear from Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox. She says her office is charging 43 felony cases related to Sunday night's event, the majority of them being burglary charges. Several others include gun possession and attempted murder. Now, coming up, we're going to hear from an Inglewood community activist about what's been happening this week. We're also going to hear from a Cook County judge who will be presiding over the community's new restorative justice court that was supposed to have had its ribbon cutting just this past Monday. Paris, we're going to hear from that judge as well. There's a lot of organizations in Inglewood, Brandis, that work very hard in that community. A lot. Yep. Thank you very much. Well, another Illinois legislator is charged with a federal crime. This is a group of lawmakers press for ethics changes. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with the latest. Amanda, it's hard to keep track of all the federal charges and criminal information. What happened today? Harris, yes, especially because this is the fourth time within roughly the past year that a sitting member of the Illinois legislature has been charged with a federal crime. Now, two then did resign from their state positions. This time, court papers show that State Senator Terry Link has been charged with federal tax fraud. Link is a Democrat from Waukegan. He's been a member of the Illinois General Assembly since 1997. And he was the chief negotiator of the bill that led to massive gambling expansion, the law that will bring a casino to Chicago, as well as to Link's native Waukegan. Link is also believed to have played a role in the indictment of former state representative Luis Arroyo last October on corruption charges. According to media reports, Link cooperated with the feds and he wore a wire to record Arroyo trying to pass along a bribe to Link in exchange for Link helping Arroyo to pass a law. Now, Link did deny wearing a wire. The one-page count unrelated to that exactly, it accuses Link of reporting a quarter million dollars of income in 2016, even though the feds say that he made substantially more than that. What's unclear is where that money came from. State legislators make roughly $70,000 a year, more if, like Link, they hold leadership positions. State records show that Link makes roughly $90,000 a year as a state senator. 
His economic interest forms, which Illinois officials are required to file, however, show not applicable on questions about outside income from the years that we're concerned with. Originally, his 2017 disclosures were the same. Years later, this January, he amended that 2017 form to detail a capital gain from selling a condo in Florida in 2016. Now, the Chicago Tribune previously reported about this and that Link failed to report making $50,000 from the condo sale. But again, the charges that were filed today say that Link in 2016 reported an income of $264,000 and that that was underreported. Now, up until today, Link wasn't just any state senator. As I mentioned, he did play a leadership role, also an appointed member of the Legislative Ethics Commission. This is the body of lawmakers that have the responsibility of deciding when alleged ethical misconduct by a member of the General Assembly is worthy of an internal investigation. A state spokesman says Link has now resigned from that. All of this comes as earlier today, a group of Democrats held a Zoom press conference to announce a slate of ethical reforms. Among them is one that is relevant. It would require officials to more fully disclose sources and amounts of outside income. Another proposal would strengthen the role of the inspector general who probes ethical misconduct by legislators, and others would deal with stricter provisions on lobbyists. This morning, again, before the latest federal charge became public, State Representative Lindsay LaPointe said that the perception of Illinois government is toxic. And the impact of that is sidelining people. And sidelining people is the opposite of what we are all here to do for a democracy to work as it should. We need to be inviting people in. So I look forward to getting this done. So yeah, the group of legislators that she's part of, 16 of them say that the goal of their measures is to change that perception, make Illinois government more transparent. But for many in Illinois politics, the face of corruption of Illinois government is longtime Speaker of the Illinois House and Chair of the Illinois Democratic Party, Michael Madigan. Hamed this summer admitted in a deal with prosecutors to spending nearly a decade bribing people close to Madigan. The speaker has denied any knowledge of that scheme or any wrongdoing, and his press people in a statement this afternoon say that passing an ethics package is a priority for Madigan and that he plans to support one when the General Assembly is back in Springfield. Now, some of the Democrats behind the new set of measures that were announced today have actually called for Madigan to step down. Among them, the point, as well as State Representative Kelly Cassidy, State Senators Melinda Bush and Heather Staines, but other Democrats that are endorsing this ethics plan have not, including State Representatives Delia Ramirez, Bob Morgan, and Mary Edley Allen. When asked whether Madigan should step down, some of them didn't answer. Others took umbrage with the question the ethics movement and the importance of having ethics reform is it, it applies throughout the, the legislature. I think it applies regardless of a single person. Amanda, as a freshman legislator, it's really, really frustrating to hear something about Speaker Madigan, because as the other speakers just mentioned, it really takes away the focus in what this message is all about. This is way bigger than Speaker Madigan. She says when it's all about Madigan, that takes the energy and focus away from the broader reform effort. If I were in his position, I would resign, but we can only control our own actions and our own behaviors. We can't control everyone. If he were gone, we still have systemic changes that need to happen in the environment in Springfield. But Republicans say unless the Democrats who put Madigan in power remove him from it, then this whole effort is political theater. Today's press conference was completely out of touch with reality on the ground, State Representative Grant Worley said in a statement. Now, Republicans also point out that they have introduced a broad panoply of ethics reforms, none of which have gone anywhere. Paris, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. 
Chicago Public Schools will be all remote for the fall, but Catholic schools in the city and suburbs are taking a different approach. The Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago announces it will offer full in-person learning in the fall and says it is within accordance of CDC guidelines. So how will the school system do it safely and are teachers and parents on board? Joining us now with more is Justin Lombardo, the Chief Human Resources Officer for the Archdiocese of Chicago. Mr. Lombardo, thanks for being here. You're welcome, Paris. Good to talk with you. Good to talk with you as well. Before we start, I just wanted to play a clip from Mayor Lightfoot from last week on why she and Chicago Public Schools made the decision to offer only remote learning. Our decision to open CPS um, remotely this fall um, is based on our evolving public health situation and feedback that we've received notably from parents and faculty. Make no mistake, here in Chicago, we are in a better place than most other areas in the country and in the surrounding area. But the fact of the matter is, we are seeing an increase in cases. So my question, Justin Lombardo, the mayor felt it wasn't safe to return to the classroom for CPS. Why is the situation different for Catholic schools? That, that's a fundamentally uh, you know, core question to this, Paris, and to the discussion about how we proceed with our school opening. I, I want to start by saying, as, as the mayor pointed out in her initial uh, comment on this, is we have sought, uh, in the course of putting together our plan for reopening the schools, we took a lot of time to look at guidance from the CDC. We also received input and, and, and looked at guidance from uh, uh, CDPH, Chicago Department of Public Health, as well as IDPH. And, and ultimately what it came down to, a recognition that school systems are all unique. And in point of fact, CPS is not like the Catholic school system, nor is the Catholic school system identical to CPS. And so the, the, the way you construct your plan to open has to be consistent with who you are. We in the guidance we received believe that we could do this safely um, and that we would adhere to the guidelines. We uniquely were able to uh, get concurrence that we were following guidelines from a panel of experts that we use uh, infectious disease physicians. Well, let, let me just jump in there. Uh, so yeah. it is a different school system. It's a much smaller school system. So what is your safety plan for students in, in the Catholic schools? Well, the first thing we're doing is we're building them into cohorts. So the first thing the, around that and the cohort model is one accepted by many public uh, health officials that indicates if you keep the same small group of students together with the same teachers on an everyday basis, and their movements are as a unit, they have lunch together in a confined space away from other people, that you are first and foremost, by using that cohort model, able to limit the amount of exposure to the number of people. And that's what we've built our plan on, is the, the cohort model. So it's a cohort model, 15 students with the same teacher all throughout the day, as opposed to different teachers, different classes. What is the protocol if there is an infection or even an outbreak? Right. If there's well, and those are two very different terms, Paris, as I'm sure you know. Um, an individual infection within a cohort, um, immediately if it happens, uh, the child becomes symptomatic while they are uh, at school, we isolate the child immediately. We have the parents come and pick them up. Upon notification that it's a positive, uh, a positive diagnosis, the entire quarantine, uh, the entire cohort, excuse me and the teacher will be asked to quarantine for the 14 days uh, that are recommended by the public health agencies. And during that time, remote learning for the children will continue. And that's one thing I wanted to point out. Even though we are um, primarily focused on an in-class, five-day-a-week return to schools, we are also offering for our parents the possibility of uh, distance learning for students where the family feels they're not comfortable yet enough or the student may have conditions that needs the remote learning. And so we do offer that option, but that's the protocol we will follow. Um, we also report immediately that um, an exposure has happened within one of our cohorts to the um, uh, local public health officials. 
and they will begin their tracing efforts. So, so there will be a lot of communication. I want to read you a, a quote from a teacher, a Catholic school teacher who wished to remain anonymous. They said they were concerned about the plan. They said, quote, of course we want to return to the classroom, but right now there are so many unknowns in the information around children, unreliable and slow testing, and increasing numbers of infected. Why take this risk? Further, every day we focus on the reopening as a day lost to making e-learning better than it was before. Not ideal, but a safer choice. What's your reaction to the concerns presented by this teacher? Well, I think uh, many individuals, parents, teachers, have concerns about any plan. Um, and no plan that you, you uh, develop is going to meet everybody's uh, comfort zone level. I would say that, that we strongly believe and would not have gone down the road of con committing to uh, reopening if we had gotten significant signals from experts that our plan, given our schools, was not safe. Again, you mentioned it, and it's true. We are very different than the public school system. We're smaller. Our schools have more spaces available to them because all of them are on a parish campus where we have additional space to use if we need to separate students, et cetera, um, in parish halls, in church basements, and those sort of things. So they can go so, to a church. They can go to the different buildings on campus. Let me just quickly ask you, have you received uh, higher enrollment as a result of this plan from perhaps public school parents that do want to be uh, having in-person learning for their kids? We, we've definitely, Paris, had uh, inquiries, a lot of them, because, you know, it's tough for the parents to make a decision. It's not an enviable position. And so we have parents that some have enrolled their children in our schools. Others have called to find out what the options are. I know that other private schools in the Chicago area um, and even in surrounding suburbs where they've chosen uh, distance learning are getting calls as well. Uh, so parents are trying to make the decision getting information. So we're seeing we're seeing a, um, a lot of in interest in what the Catholic schools are doing. Yes. All right. We'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Justin Lombardo. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. And be sure to stay with us ahead in the program. Student activists call for the removal of police from Chicago public schools. But first we go to Phil Ponce and the economic implications of a canceled college football season. Phil. Paris sports fans looking forward to college football this fall may have to wait a little longer. This week, the Big Ten and Pac-12 announced they're postponing the fall sports season because of coronavirus-related health and safety concerns. The news comes as a disappointment to many players, coaches, and fans, and its economic consequences could reach far beyond the game itself. Joining us to talk about the financial fallout of the canceled college football season is Danny Ecker, a reporter at Crane Chicago Business. Danny, thank you for joining us. And just give us a big picture in terms of the financial engine that football is. Well, there are, you know, college towns that are built around it. I mean, that, that says a lot, especially in the Big Ten between cities like Columbus and Ann Arbor and Madison and State College, Iowa City, Lincoln. You know, it's hard to relate to a little bit in Chicago because we're so much of a pro sports town. But, uh, you know, college football Saturdays in the fall, there are businesses built around it. And, um, you know, this is a huge blow, economic blow to, to uh, lots of different businesses beyond just uh, the Big Ten and the schools and, um, and certainly the, the TV networks that uh, were planning to show these games. Well, clearly this is an unprecedented step and uh, Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren talked with the Big Ten Network on Tuesday about the decision and here's what he said. It's people first and uh, as students and, and understand they're also, they're not professionals. These are amateur athletes and they deserve an opportunity to be able to participate in a healthy and safe manner. Danny, they're amateur athletes, all right, but in terms of, uh, how does it work with, uh, in terms of revenue that, uh, that advertisers get, that, you know, that the university gets? Uh, give us an idea of how that pie is split up. Well, the big piece of the pie is from broadcast rights, which is, you know, why we've seen really the professional sports put so much effort into making sure that they can put out a product that even if there are no fans in attendance can be shown on TV. It's made for TV. You know, the, the rights fees that uh, TV networks and increasingly tech companies are willing to pay to show live sports have gotten really out of hand. Uh, and so that's driven up in pro sports, a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, salary increases and in college sports, just huge sums of money that these schools get. So, uh, you know, for example, 
the Big Ten has, has really led the way. They Big Ten signed a, a new six-year uh, broadcasting deal back in 2017 with Fox and ESPN and CBS that started back in again a couple of years ago. Um, the schools just last year, their last fiscal year, got uh, more than $50 million a piece from that. Um, about six years before that, it was only half that. It was $25 million. So, you know, these networks can justify basically paying out the nose to be able to show the rights to these games because it draws a lot of eyeballs. And um, these athletic departments uh, are, are, you know, rely on that revenue in many cases from football and basketball to pay for non-revenue sports, sports that uh, don't drive as much revenue. So there are far-reaching impacts certainly to athletic departments when you uh, when you have um, these these games not being played, mostly because the broadcast revenue uh, is not going to be there. Well, broadcast revenue in the vicinity of 50 to $55 million a year per college, that's huge. Let's take a look at, uh, here's what the Vice President for Athletics and Recreation at Northwestern University, James Phillips, had to say in a statement. He said, quote, our entire Northwestern community is heartbroken by the necessary decisions made today by the Big Ten Conference. Even as we stand in full confidence, we are making the right decision. The health and safety of more than 500 student athletes always has been and will continue to be our number one priority. And my understanding is uh, one of the main concerns that a lot of uh, uh, people in athletics had was the, uh, the side effects for young athletes, and that can include long-term scarring of the heart as a side effect of COVID-19. But uh, in terms of uh, what this means for, you mentioned other sports, uh, what role does football expand on what role football plays in funding the other sports like cross country and lacrosse and field hockey and so forth well you've already seen some schools uh not so much at major uh major universities although stanford has taken some steps on this some schools at smaller universities have already cut some sports because they know they're not going to have the funding uh without their revenue generating sports um, so, you know, it's different, certainly based on uh, the size of the school. And, you know, we're seeing um, different schools respond in different ways. Some who are saying they're, they want to, you know, bigger schools saying they want to do whatever it takes to maybe even try to switch conferences if they could even legally do that to, to make sure they can play. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's clear that these, that most schools, uh, you know, need to get these games played because it's a, a revenue generator and obviously they uh, want to have their their student athletes on the field. Big Ten and Pac-12 are two of the five so-called power conferences. It's still unclear. The other three co uh, power conferences have left, you know, as if my understanding is they've left the window open to potentially open, but Nebraska that's in the Big Ten is has made rumblings about possibly playing anyway. Can they do that? I, I don't know, uh, Phil. I, I do think that uh, from what I've seen, I think there are some some legal boundaries that, that keep uh, these schools playing in their conferences. And I think there may have to be some uh, lawyers parsing some text to figure out whether there are hurdles they can easily clear to do that. Um, so I, I'm not really sure how much of, you know, the talk around that is trying to generate leverage to, you know, get a plan in place to have a spring season or exactly what the, the, the strategy is there. But, but I, I'm not so sure exactly how, how that's going to work and, and um, whether or not any of these schools can, Nebraska or, or any other schools can, can actually say, well, I'm just going to play in the SEC or, or the Big 12 for, for a fall. Danny Ecker, thank you so much. You mentioned uh, the possibility of spring football. That's another thing that's, uh, that's on the table in terms of pushing back the season to the spring. We'll see. Danny Ecker, thanks a lot. We appreciate your insights. And now, Paris, we go back to you. Spring football, that'll be interesting to see. All right, thanks, Phil. Still to come on Chicago tonight, how to close the pay gap between black women and white men. Chicago Public School students call for removing officers from school hallways. What local school councils are doing to address this controversy. The way the citrus interacts with the environment, you know, it's kind of like a sun catcher. How an artist is pushing her fruit to the limit to create wearable art. And meet a Chicago woman who took a deep dive in shark footage, more than 800 hours of it. 
But first, some of tonight's top stories. The University of Chicago's president announces he'll step down and step into the new role of chancellor at the end of the current academic year. Robert Zimmer, who became the university's 13th president in 2006, was due to remain in his current post through at least 2020, but he announced his intention to accelerate his transition at a meeting of the Board of Trustees on Wednesday. According to a university statement, Zimmer had surgery in May to remove a malignant brain tumor, but has since returned to work and is responding well to treatment. Illinois passes another grim pandemic milestone with more than 200,000 cases of COVID-19 now confirmed in the state. In the past 24 hours, a further 1,800 cases were reported and 24 more deaths. The Illinois Department of Public Health has now recorded almost 7,700 deaths across 102 counties. And it looks like there's going to be no White Sox Cardinals baseball on Friday night. Major League Baseball is reportedly planning to push back the Sox scheduled game against the St. Louis Cardinals who have not played since July 29th after multiple players and staff tested positive for COVID-19. According to a tweet from Bob Nightingale of USA Today, the Cardinals could resume their season with a doubleheader against the White Sox on Saturday, providing all tests remain negative. And now we return to Brandis Friedman with more on the Englewood community. Brandis. And Paris, as we mentioned earlier, the Cook County Circuit Court is opening a restorative justice community court in Englewood, which was supposed to have had its ribbon cutting on Monday. Now, of course, it was postponed because of the unrest in that community. As part of Chicago Tonight's In Your Neighborhood series, earlier today we spoke with Judge Donna Cooper, who is a daughter of Inglewood and will be presiding over that court. We started with an explanation of what is restorative justice. It gives the person that does the wrong, the person that's harmed, and the community opportunity to uh, put themselves back together. It, the person that does the wrong needs to acknowledge, acknowledge that they did a wrong, there's a person that is harmed. They want to know that you acknowledge that you that they've been hurt. And then the community helps put that all back together. You come to the community uh, or you have the community participate. You have the community say to the parties, we understand that you committed a crime. We understand that you've been hurt. We want to help to put you back together to restore you to community, make you a valuable, viable part of the community. So in that sense, that's uh, what we hope to do with this court here. We are taking young people from the ages of 18 to 26 who have not been charged with a crime or this is their first time uh, uh, char crime charge, giving them the opportunity to keep a clean record. So in this program, there is no admission of guilt at this time. I know there, there's some other programs, I believe the New York court, we've been to that one, where they've already admitted or pled guilty, and if they don't complete the program, uh, then they have that guilt, uh, uh, that finding of guilt over them. But in our courtroom, or our purposes for restorative justice, we give you the opportunity to uh, participate in the program. It's not mandatory; you don't have to do it. And what so does the program mean? Like, do, do they or do they receive services? Um, they will receive services. That's the good part about the whole program, and that's part two of what you could consider the restorative part because we give them up the opportunity to acknowledge what they've done and then to try and to make up for that. We, gonna, we wanna offer them services, so say you, maybe you did something because you didn't have a job. Okay, maybe you don't have a job because you didn't have an ID. Or you know, there's something that you need in order to go ahead with your life. So we're gonna give them services that would help them get an ID if they need counseling, to have counseling, if they need job training, to have job training. So those are services that we're gonna offer them, and those services are gonna come from the community members. And why was it, it, that it sounds then to me like that's probably the reason it's important to have such a court in the community, in Inglewood. Why Inglewood? Right. Why does Inglewood need this well, court? Well, you know, I think this program would be beneficial in every community in the city of Chicago. But we're starting with Inglewood, and I, I suppose we're starting with the uh, communities that may have the higher crime statistics. So Inglewood is, has been uh, on the burner for a while. Your Honor, you're from Inglewood. Correct. What's been your reaction to what we've been seeing in, in the last week, in the last mo few months, really? Well, you know, 
the looting is disheartening. But then again, you, you've got to think too. Uh, why would a person loot? And, you know, what's the purpose of doing it? I suppose, well, I know there's a lot of anger. And there's also a, not, a lot of opportunity that I believe that many of the looters have. And I don't, you know, I think part of it is that if they feel hopeless and if they feel that they don't have a future, then, you know, they've got nothing to lose. You can blow up your present if you don't have a, if you don't know that you have a future. And Judge Cooper says she thinks the restorative justice court can help restore a sense of hope for Inglewood residents. It is scheduled to start its work on September 14th. Now, Paris, we go back to you. Thanks, Prandis. The decision to remove police resource officers in school hallways has been up to local school councils, but today student activists decided to march to the mayor's house to cast their vote, so to speak. WTTW news reporter Matt Masterson was there and joins us now with more details. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Good, how are you, Paris? I'm fine, thanks. So, student uh, activists are marching at the mayor's house, even though this decision is in the hands of each school's local school councils. What, what was the march about? So the board, the board of Education this month is expected to vote on whether or not it's going to renew the Chicago Public Schools contract with the Chicago Police Department to provide school resources across the district in any school. So regardless of how these individual LLCs have voted on the issue for their school communities so far, these activists wanted the board to terminate that district-wide contract and effectively remove funding for SROs in any school. Um, and it was Lightfoot who obviously appointed these board members and has opposed the broad removal of SROs across Chicago's public schools. So that's why they marched to her house today. And, uh, and back in June, the, the mayor also spoke out against removing SROs, and the board has already rejected one motion to uh, terminate that contract. And in fact, they've uh, they, they've sort of have the funding for it. So are you saying in a month they might vote again and just eliminate it entirely? Correct. So there, there was a previous motion that sought to just eliminate the, the contract, but later this month, uh, the board has to vote to renew it on an annual basis. So that's what that vote is going to be. And remind us again how this landed in the decision of each local school council. So Lightfoot and CPS CEO Janice Jackson have said they don't feel it's appropriate for CPS to issue just a broad mandate and say that schools either must or must not have school resource officers. So they've instead left it up to these local school councils because they say that these are more in tune with the individual local school communities and they know what's best for that community. So they say they'll respect whatever decision these LSCs make. Um, a, a dozen or so LSCs have already voted to remove their school resource officers, but many others have voted to maintain their SRO programs. They all must decide by the end of this week. All right, we'll have to watch this in a month. Thank you very much, Matt. Yep. And you can read Matt's full story on our website. And if you're interested in seeing which local school councils have voted to keep or remove officers, we have an interactive map for just that. It's all at WTTW.com news. According to census data, women in the workplace, especially black women, make far less than white men on average. In fact, the average black woman would have to work 20 months to make what the average white man makes in 12 months. This is despite studies showing that black women as a group are just as educated and qualified as their white male counterparts. Joining us to talk about why this gap persists is Sharita Ellens, president and CEO of Women Employed, a nonprofit advocacy group for working women. Sharita Ellens, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, today's date, August 13th, is relevant to this discussion. Explain why. Because this marks the date in which we can earmark when black women um, would have to work to earn as much as her white non-Hispanic male colleague um, to what they earned by the close of 2019. So that's essentially saying that we have to work 19 and a half months to what they have to work in, in 12 months to earn the same amount. And it might not be easy to boil this down, but what is driving this wage disparity? Oh my goodness, there are a, a few drivers of this, of this uh, disparity. Um, one at the top of the list, obviously, is, is gender and, and racial discrimination that still continues to persist. Um, we also uh, talk about occupational segregation, which is where women are overrepresented in low wage jobs and underrepresented in higher wage jobs. We know that society puts less value 
on women dominated jobs like child care, teaching and home health aides. So they aren't paid um, what they're worth basically. Um, we also know that there's the caregiving burden. Uh, the majority of home and caregiving responsibilities fall on women. We also know that harassment and lack of quality job benefits such as paid sick days and paid family and medical leave and fair and predictable schedules also impact the pay gap. What about within the same jobs or the same industries? And this has historically been the case, but is it still the case that uh, black women are making less to do the same job as men are? Yes. They, across all occupations from the top to the bottom, there is a wage disparity between women and men, period, and, and it continues to persist even more for black women and for Latinas. And we have some more statistics here. Uh, one in three black women work frontline jobs. They're twice as likely to have been affected by job cuts than white men. 48% mm -hmm. cannot afford food and housing right now. So this is black working women during COVID. So why has this demographic been hit especially hard in the pandemic? Just like we said, because they're overrepresented in those particular jobs. So while black women make up only 6.3% of the overall workforce, they make up 26% of personal care aides and home health aides and nursing assistants and more than 15% of cashiers and retail associates and healthcare social workers and things of that sort. So they are in these roles that are affected in two ways. One, they're on the front line and they, um, uh, they have more risk to be impacted by COVID, but they're also uh, the ones that are losing their jobs at a higher rate. Um, and, you, as well. and you said society has chosen to value these jobs less by paying less for this kind of work. So what are policies that you believe that should be enacted to close this wage gap? Well, I think it's bigger than policy. So there are policies in place. I think that we need to have transparent um, data collection around pay equity within in, within uh, companies and, and employers, but we also need to shift our value system as a society. Um, there should not be a case for the fact that a janitor can make more than someone that is caring for your children or your elderly parents. And, and you're saying this is just because those jobs like janitors have, have traditionally been populated by men and men just tend to make more money than women. Absolutely. And, and, and research shows that as women go into roles that were dominated by men, the salaries go down. And in roles that are dominated by women and men end up taking over, the salaries go up. So uh, it, it, it is absolutely pointed to gender and racial discrimination uh, and, and the value of our work and the value of our work. And, and in a broader sense, what is, what is the impact on the economy as a whole when women get paid less than men? Well, especially for black women, there's just a, a less opportunity to build wealth and there's a less opportunity to build that economic security that you need to take care of yourself and your family so that when you're in a situation like we're in right now with this public health crisis and you have women saying that they feel that they don't have enough money to cover their basic needs. There was a study that came out that um, said that 60% uh, of Latinx women and 55% of black women currently have less than $200 in savings. That is a huge impact on our society, a huge impact on our families and on our communities. We have to begin talking about pay equity in connection with what's happening in our communities, what's happening with unstable housing, the fact that we have so many women living in poverty, the fact that the violence that's happening in our communities, all of this can be tied to the fact that there is a, a um, pay equity issues because it leads to the wealth gap as well. All right, that's certainly a start with statistic. My thanks to Sharita Ellens. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And now, Brandis, we go back to you.
In Paris, as we mentioned earlier, the start of the week was a tense one in the Inglewood community on Chicago's south side after police shot and wounded a 20-year-old 20, 20 man. As part of Chicago Tonight's In Your Neighborhood series, earlier today, we caught up with community leader Roshana Baldwin, who says what came after the incident wasn't just about a shooting. Over the last week, we saw a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos. In reaction to what happened on Sunday and Monday, I do not believe and we don't feel that it was so much of a di direct correlation, correlation of the looting and then turning from the shooting. Um, we saw young kids out there lost, confused, and pretty much co-opted and, you know, used as pawns to do and take advantage of an unfortunate situation that happened on Sunday. And the confusion and the chaos came from what was on social media. Um, it's no secret that the global pandemic has devastated us. Uh, jobs have been lost, even the little jobs that were available, whether it was the mom and pop shops, the corner stores here in Inglewood, those were jobs for actual residents, our actual people that we knew and those are gone. So any little hope that we had to try to get back to normal has been, it disappeared. And I can't judge the reaction and what the kids did, the young adults did, I understand is not right, but I understand. I also understand they're being co-op, they're being played, they're used as pawns, and they don't really see that. It's also just a lack of the resources that that doesn't exist in our community. And people often say, well, what does that mean? Because you have X, Y, and Z. But when jobs are being taken out of our community, when hospitals are being closed down, um, it's no secret that the four hospitals, St. Bernard, Mercy, Trinity Advocate, and South Shore are trying to, was trying to stay open, but our elected officials, black elected officials, did not consider that deal. So now you're gonna take a major employer out of our neighborhood. St. Bernard is struggling. Those are the opportunities and resources that's being lacked. Um, so a, a lack of resources, you know, with what happened the other day, some folks think that there's a generational divide. Is it generational? A thousand percent generational divide. When I saw the Facebook Live and saw the kids and saw the young adults in the faces of the officers, disrespecting them, spitting at them. We have to have accountability in our own community. The, uh, the cops didn't come out there trying to create tension and be upset and push them. What I saw with my own eyes were these young kids getting in the faces of cops. I'm like, what are you thinking? Being agitated by them, what are you, if you're spitting at a cop, you're getting in their face. The officers were behind yellow line, I mean, behind a yellow tape. We know that they have to try to control a crime scene or control just a scene period and keep some type of crowd control. And that looks like telling them to get back. But then when you're disrespecting them, spitting in them, get, putting your finger in their face is going to create some type of tension. And rightfully so, I understand. We understand that so many of us are hurting from the trauma, from the mental issues that's going on after seeing so many others getting shot, killed innocently, and we don't have that type of mental health assistance training. The officers don't have that training to go into and defuse the situation being sensitive. So it's met with resistance. Okay, so before I let you go, really quick, you know, I've talked to a number of people in Inglewood today who tell me about the resilience and how the folks in the community are really good at doing it for themselves, recognizing that nobody's coming to save us, we can do this. Um, but all of that said, what does Inglewood need? <laughs> I applaud the efforts of individuals, whether it's the Inglewood Political Task Force who came out there and controlled the situation. I applaud the efforts of Teamwork Inglewood. I applaud the efforts of Not Before My Parents who are really working to foster these better relations with the community, with the police. What do we need? We would love for the mayor, we would love for the superintendent to talk to authentic community leaders like myself, not the ones who are jumping in front of the cameras to get some quick sound bite. Inglewood needs a lot. We need the basic four to five things that make a community thriving. Economic development, quality housing, uh, great access to health care, uh, jobs that's tangible, jobs that's going to stay in these communities and not leave after they get the tax breaks, after our elected officials lobby for them, but then they're not held accountable to remain in our community. That's what we need. We need those real conversations. We need our police department, 7 District Police Department, the cops that don't look like me, the white cops, to be a part of these conversations, to pull back those layers and sit down with us and really address the tension that exists racially. 
Now, something else we heard today from Roshana Baldwin and others in Inglewood was that there is a constant flow of crime news about Inglewood. She works to combat that through her campaign Good in Inglewood. One thing that she says that is good, this Saturday's Inglewood Back to School Parade for rising ninth graders. It's been going on for 50 years. This year it's a car caravan, but students will receive supplies to help get their school year started. Up next, a retired shed employee turned citizen scientist takes Shark Week to a whole other level. We share her story, but first, a look at the weather. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. It's Shark Week, and to celebrate, we've got a whopper of a story about a local woman who spent 800 hours diving with sharks without ever leaving her home in Chicago. If that sounds fishy, well, WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley is here to explain. Patty, good to see you. Hey, Paris. All right, Patty, I'm going to try and solve the riddle here. Does she live in an aquarium, or did she just do a, a Zoom uh, <laughs> shark dive? Um, you're closer in the second part, you know, Chicago kind of has its own aqua woman and her name is Betty Goldberg and she took part in this massive citizen science project through the shed aquarium where she retired from being um, a manager of their volunteer dive pro project and then kind of turned right around and volunteered 800 hours watching videos of sharks. 800 hours watching videos of sharks and tell us more about yes. this citizen science project. What, uh, what was it out to uh, accomplish? Yeah, it's called the Global Fin Print Project and it's the first ever worldwide survey of reef sharks. And so cameras, you know, went to more than 300, almost 400 reefs around the world, took video of what was going on down there. They had 15,000 hours of video and then somebody had to watch all of that to look for what's going on with the shark population. And so Betty Goldberg's 800 hours was like 5% of the global total. And um, unfortunately, they discovered that a lot of reefs have lost almost their entire shark population. So the next step is going to be to see what we can do to conserve sharks. To try to restore that population. All right, Patty, yes. it sounds like the safest way to dive with sharks if one is <laughs> going to do that. All right, thank you so much. Thanks. And you can read Patty's full story on our website where you'll find more videos of sharks and stingrays. That's at WTTW.com slash news. What do oranges, grapefruits, and limes all have in common? They're, of course, all fruits, but they're also being used in an art project turning citrus into jewelry. You heard that right. Arts correspondent Angel Ito explains. Citrus has always played a prominent role in Talia Santos's life. There was no big like aha moment. I grew up in a Greek household, so lemons were always a huge part of my life. And then I worked and traveled a lot in South America and limes were a big part of life there. So I've always had this citrus something following me. And two years ago, I started playing around with it and dried out some oranges, which has been done before, <laughs> and then just turned it into jewelry. To be cautious of her roommates, we met at a local park instead of her home so she could demonstrate some of the process with me as her assistant. Since I do it by hand, each piece comes out a little differently so it makes each pair unique. The first thing to do is slice it, easy enough. We always start with either the dimple on that side or that side. Mm -hmm. You're going to cut just kind of like the rindy part off mm -hmm. and then you want your slices to be as thin and like accurate, you know, thin and the same as possible. Okay. After that, I go through the dehydrating process, which takes about 12 hours, more or less, so we're not going to do that <laughs> now. Um, and then I go through the varnishing part, which also takes about a few days to varnish and fully dry and then we turn it into jewelry. So here I have a really small hand drill. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna just kind of poke into the rind because if you don't get it in the rind, it'll kind of destroy the, the prettiest part of the orange. And so I can put it right here. Yep. 
and that's okay. Yeah, totally. We take our jump rings, the pliers, add the earring, and you have an orange earring. <laughs> Now, Santosa Citrus isn't exclusive to just jewelry. Window pieces, umbrellas, lampshades, just kind of pushing it and going outside the box, especially because the way the citrus interacts with the environment, it's kind of like a sun catcher. You would think that reusing citrus to create jewelry would be more sustainable, but you said that it actually isn't? The great thing about using fruit is that it cuts out a whole emission process of plastic or metals or things that are kind of being produced in factories. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm still using metals for ear wires. I'm still having to buy packaging to put the earrings in. So there's a lot of ways I'm able to offset those costs to make it more sustainable. But at the end of the day, production is production. But regardless of these production factors, Santos says there's beauty in the eye of the orange holder. I think it's really telling about how much is right in front of us and how much we can use what's in front of us. This is an orange and it's beautiful and you know, you don't have to go far and wide to find that. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And before the pandemic hit, Talia's art was available in boutiques and farmers markets all across the Chicago area. But that, of course, has since changed. You can visit our website for more information on how you can order your Citrus by Talia online. And that is our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe. See you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm named by elite lawyers as the top aviation firm in the country in 2020.